Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to River Heights. Glad to have you here this morning. My name is Justin. I'm one of the worship leaders around here. Uh, we're going to invite you to stand as you are able. And if you know the drill here, you'll know that we start our services usually with a couple songs as an opportunity to worship and just kind of set our hearts in a direction. Uh, and so as we do that, I'm just going to open with a quick word of prayer here this morning. You know, in the, in the Bible, Jesus promises that wherever there are two or more gathered in his name, that he's present. And so that's our prayer this morning is just to say, Jesus, we acknowledge you this morning. We welcome you in this place. We ask that you would just hear our hearts cry, that you would receive our praises as we sing, that you would just meet us in this place this morning. So God, we just say thank you in advance for all that you are doing, and we just uh, look forward to seeing that in, in a blame this on Curtis. I started chatting before the service and it's a bad thing to do. You love you, Curtis. I'm like, why can't I hear myself? That's because I didn't do the thing. <laughs> Try that one more time. <clears throat> we were talking about how the technology can fail, but it, 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 you know, most of that's taken care of, but it doesn't account for operator error and I do plenty of that. <laughs> All right. That feels better. Perfect. All right. Now, let's worship. <laughs> Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all the kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder?
so grateful that you are here. We just exalt you this morning as we lift up our voices with these simple songs, God. We lift our voices up to honor you.
So you may be seated, and we are going to switch over this morning to having some announcements, and that will be with Pete. And Pete, it looks like you have a helper this morning. Is this true? I do. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. I'm Gina, one of the pastors here. And who are you, young lady? Good morning. I am Margaret, and I'm one of the kids here at the church. Oh, you are. If you are visiting with us today, we just want you to know we are so glad that you came. We hope you'll stop by after the service, say hi to John. He's preaching today. He'd love to give you the welcome box. And uh, it's just our way of saying that we're glad you came today. We hope that you have an encounter with God. Uh, we have a purpose here as a community. What is our purpose, Margaret? Love God, love people, and change the world. Amen. <laughs> Every week you can give toward that purpose and be a part of what God does through this church, which is a pretty great gift. Uh, you give electronically with the instructions behind me, or you can put gifts in the connection card boxes. Either way, we like to pray and for giving. So God, we're so grateful for your generosity, and we want to be like you. Help us to be generous like you are, God. And, uh, you know, as we're generous, we ask that you put your hand on the finances we offer, that you turn it into people loving you and loving each other, here and outside our walls and around the world. Amen. Amen. Uh, what are we going to do next? Connection card. Okay, I'm going to read here. Connection card. Please take out your connection card from your program. We can just skip through that for now. Each week you ask us, you are with <laughs> spot for prayer requests and a spot for God's stories. Share your prayer requests with us. The staff and prayer team pray for every request we receive. We want you to know that you're being prayed for in the church. And then God's stories are stuff God does in your life, and you can share those with us. We'll put them up here. And let's see. Next week, everybody, this is a big one. We are going to be having one service only next week at 1030. And so if you came at 1030, uh, awesome. What happens if you come to first service next week? Sad and lonely, sad and lonely, sad and lonely, all right? So that's what happens, so don't do it, all right? We're going to have a barbecue following the service. River Heights is going to provide the barbecue. We are asking everybody to bring a side to share. And so whatever a side means from you, whether grandma would have stopped by Cub to get the pasta salad or whether you make something great, uh, just bring a side to share if you're able to do so. Um, if you can let us know on the connection card that you plan on coming, it would just help us with, like, numbers and how many and so forth. All right, what do we have coming up next, Margaret? Connect class Sunday, July 14th, 1 p.m. If you are looking for a church home in ways that might help you connect, our membership classes offer the opportunity to get to know about River Heights Vineyard. Meet some of the, our staff members. And connect with other attenders at River Heights Vineyard. Connect, Belong, and Grow can be taken in any order. They're 50% discussion and 50% So they're super enjoyable. I would love to meet you at one of these classes. If you haven't taken them, sign up and come on down. We'll have a good time together. The School of Kingdom Ministry, uh, you have an opportunity to run the School of Kingdom Ministry again this year. Every year we have enough people, we're going to run this thing. It is the best training we offer in living the life of faith. It is the number one thing that we can offer you to grow in your life of faith. I don't know how else to put that. And so I just think it would be awesome if you were to sign up as interested in the School of Kingdom Ministry if you have not been through. It's about training people to maintain your connection with God through the Holy Spirit day in and day out, week in and week out. It is fantastic stuff. Past School of Kingdom Ministry students say that results have included growing in their relationship with God, replacing fear with confidence, and confirming their place in the kingdom it really is about your identity and about your day-to-day -day connection with the living God. And so if you're interested, sign up and Sandy Knutson will contact you with more information. Where do the middle schoolers go now, Margaret? Middle church. All right, out those two doors there, grades kind of six through nine in the youth room starting now. Everybody else, please take a minute, say hi to someone near you. And uh, John's gonna be up to deliver the message forthwith.
one of your friends. Some of you very much. My name is John. I'm one of the worship pastors here at River Heights Vineyard. Um, I'm also one of the members of our volunteer preaching team. We have several folks who take turns bringing messages to us. We hear from different voices. So that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> that's why I'm here at this point in the service. Um, and today, as many of us know, we're taking the next step into the story of Moses, the leader of the ancient Israelite people. He was chosen by God to lead the Hebrew tribe out of slavery in Egypt. This story, as many of us know, is called the Exodus. Exit from slavery. If you were here last week, you heard John Marsden share that Moses needed God's good words and God's works to accomplish the mission that God gave to him. Today, we're going to talk more about the works side of that. God's works and setting the Israelites free in this story. And we're going to return in chapter 7, Exodus chapter 7, if you like to read along. And the story starts today with Moses coming back to the place where it all began for him, back to the banks of the Nile River. Would you pray with me real quick as we, as we dive in? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, would you accomplish only your good works in us this morning? Whatever is of you, we ask that it would stick. We ask that you would grow us in your love, make us more like Jesus, even as we share this story that's been passed down to us. We trust you, God. Amen. It's great to be with you, friends. I'm, I'm just feeling that today. Uh, as many of us will remember, the Exodus story begins actually before Moses was born. So back then, the Egyptian pharaoh, or the king of the Egyptian culture, saw the Hebrew people who were living in his land as a threat rather than as people God loved. Pharaoh saw these folks as competitors, not as contributors to the culture. And so he took violent and cruel action against the Hebrews, and the story also calls them the Israelite people. Pharaoh wanted to make sure these Israelite folks didn't grow and become too powerful. And so he commanded that their baby boys be drowned in the Nile River. It's pretty heavy stuff. And this was the world that Moses was born into. Like many Hebrew baby boys before him, Moses was given up to the Nile. However, Moses was saved from drowning through the ingenuity of his birth mother, who floated him in a watertight basket on the water. <clears throat> Moses was also saved through the mercy of his adoptive mother, who was actually Pharaoh's daughter. It's a dramatic story. And unlike Pharaoh, Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's daughter could look at a Hebrew child with compassion. So on that day when Moses was set adrift onto the Nile, he started a life of living in between. There's a few different ways that Moses' life was in between. First, he belonged to two different families at once. So after he was rescued by Pharaoh's daughter, he got to return to his birth mother, but she wasn't just his birth mother anymore. She was an employee, a wet nurse working for the court. He's in two families. Moses also belongs to two cultures at once. Some of us know what that feels like. Moses is a victim of Egypt like other Hebrew babies, but he's also a beneficiary of Egyptian privilege and status. He's Egyptian, but not completely. In his adult life, Moses actually commits a crime. He kills an Egyptian who was beating a Hebrew enslaved man, and then Moses has to flee. And he learns through that experience that he actually doesn't have the same rights as the rest of the royal family. He's Egyptian as long as he stays in line. He's like many minority uh, folks in our, in our country today. But historically had to show that they're not just citizens. They have to act like model citizens because they're unfairly treated as representatives of their you know, respective groups. Moses knows that experience. Moses also belongs to two places at once. He lived and grew up in Egypt but then he flees to the wilderness after he commits this crime. He's geographically in between. And this is, this is going to become a crucial, crucial part of the story, as we'll see uh, as we stick along through Exodus, that God will actually lead the Israelite people into the wilderness Moses had returned from. 
Actually, Moses mediates between a lot of different parties. He's kind of stuck in the middle. So he mediates between the Israelite people and between Pharaoh. There's not really any other people in the story that can speak to Pharaoh with the authority that Moses does. It's a really beautiful way his upbringing prepared him for this call. Also, Moses lived between death and life. He kind of had this, this middle road. Like other Hebrew boys, he was sent to the Nile. Unlike other Hebrew boys, he came back. He was rescued. And finally, Moses mediates between God and, and people. He, between God and the Egyptians. And later on the series, we'll see how God, Moses mediates between God and his own Israelite people as well. If you were here a couple weeks ago, you heard Rena preach about God's call to Moses. God called Moses to save his people because he was preparing Moses through this in-between way of living. Moses was uniquely suited to mediate between God and Pharaoh to set his people free. Have you ever felt like you were in between things? Maybe you feel like you belong to two places at once. I felt that way. Maybe you belong to two cultures at once, whatever those groups or subcultures are. Maybe some of us get asked to mediate between family members or between friends. We get stuck in the middle. It's not always easy to be in between. As followers of Jesus, I think we all know this experience in some way. We know what it feels like to live in between to some degree. We see in the story of the Bible that Christians live in the world, but not of the world. We answer to a higher power than our cultures or our governments. We also live in the now and the not yet, like we say often here at River Heights. In the now, we experience God's good kingdom breaking into our lives. We also experience that it's not all the way here. We deal with the pain and the injustices in our world like all of our brother, brothers and sisters do. So we need God's call, just like Moses did. Moses needed God's call before his in-between life started to make sense. We need the same thing. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us so this in-between way of living can be a part of God's redemption in the world rather than a part of human division. We need that. So Moses says yes to God's call, and he follows God back to the banks of the Nile River, where it all began. And if you'd like to follow along, we'll pick up the story in chapter 7. In this scene, Moses and his brother Aaron are right in the middle of confronting Pharaoh. And so we can read together, you can follow along. Then the Lord said to Moses, pay close attention to this. I will make you seem like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. Tell Aaron everything I commanded you. And Aaron must command Pharaoh to let the people of Israel leave his country. But I will make Pharaoh's heart stubborn so I can multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. Even then, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you. So I will bring down my fist on Egypt. Then I will rescue my forces, the Israelite people, from the land of Egypt with great acts of judgment. When I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Israelites, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. It's pretty impressive. And this is a direct challenge to Pharaoh's authority. In Egyptian culture, the Pharaoh was actually considered divine. He was a god to the Egyptian people in his time. Now in the story, apparently, the true god is going to make it so Pharaoh feels like Moses is, is the divine one. So the Egyptian people recognize that Moses' God, the God of his people, is the true God of all. John Marsden mentioned last week in the message, God is directly confronting Pharaoh because Pharaoh has loved his own authority more than the people he rules. He loves himself more than other people, basically. So Moses goes to Pharaoh's court, and he performs some miraculous signs, but Pharaoh's heart, the story tells us, remained hard. He still refused to listen, just as the Lord had predicted. And so we will read a little more of the story together, uh, picking up in verse 14. Then, after Pharaoh remained stubborn, 
Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn, and he still refuses to let the people go. So go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes down to the river. Stand on the bank of the Nile and meet him there. Then announce to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to tell you, let my people go so they can worship me in the wilderness. Until now, you have refused to listen to him. So this is what the Lord says. I will show you that I am the Lord. Look, I will strike the water of the Nile with this staff in my hand, and the river will turn to blood. The fish in it will die. The river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink any water from the Nile. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. As Pharaoh and all of his officials watched, Aaron raised his staff and struck the water of the Nile. Suddenly, the whole river turned to blood. The fish in the river died, and the water became so foul the Egyptians couldn't drink it. There was blood everywhere throughout the land of Egypt. But again, the magicians of Egypt used their magic, and they too turned water into blood. So Pharaoh's heart remained hard. Crazy. He refused to listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had predicted. So Pharaoh returned to his palace and put the whole thing out of his mind. Then all the Egyptians dug along the riverbank to find drinking water, for they couldn't drink the water from the Nile. Wow. Pretty crazy. <laughs> so the Nile River was, and, and, and is, I imagine, the agricultural and economic lifeblood of Egypt. It's the reason Egyptian civilization uh, developed where it did, kind of like how Minneapolis was built on the site of a natural falls on the Mississippi, and where uh, European settlers could, could use hydropower from mills. In e ancient Egypt, the Nile would flood every year, and nutrients from the river would soak up into the croplands on either side of the banks, and it made the whole Nile watershed a really fertile territory for growing crops. It's central to the power of Egypt, just like the Mississippi River or the Minnesota, the St. Croix Rivers are central to our economy and our culture here in Minnesota. Turning this huge river into blood is a massive act of power right out of the gate. God is showing Pharaoh and the Egyptian people the very thing their lives depend on is at God's mercy. I also don't think it's a coincidence that this first plague that God inflicts upon Egypt is to turn the river into blood. I bet the Egyptians watching the river turn to blood would have remembered the Hebrew children who died there under the previous Pharaoh. Just like the ancient Bible story of Cain and Abel, which is the story of the first murder, God is telling the current Pharaoh, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground, or in this case, the Nile. I think God's doing a little more than this even, more than holding Egypt accountable for their past crimes. Back in Exodus chapter 4, God says that Israel is my firstborn son. And so in this story, when the river turns to blood, God is a parent coming at someone who would harm his child. God's going mama bear on Egypt right now in this story. I think it's worth remembering today, right now, that we worship a God who knows the pain of losing a child. If we zoom out from this story to the bigger story of the Bible, I think this is a foreshadowing to the death of Jesus Christ, the firstborn son of God. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But right now, Pharaoh sees the water of the Nile turn to blood. Does he repent? No. As soon as he sees that his own court magicians can do something similar, they can also turn water into blood, he can start to fit this phenomenon into his own narrative that Egypt's power, his own power, can hang with the big players. He doesn't need to feel threatened, apparently. I wonder, though, if this is kind of reflexive on his part, if his pride is starting to talk. He might be able, or might be starting to doubt his own position. Even if the court ma uh, magicians can turn the, wa the water into blood, like Moses and Aaron, to me, turning the whole Nile into blood is kind of a different thing than whatever small amount of water these, these guys were, were working with. But Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's pride is, is in between his vision. He's not going to repent after just one miraculous sign. 
He's not going to repent for his predecessor's cruelty. So God directs the comeuppance train to keep on rolling. The God, Moses, Aaron team is going to unleash nine more crazy supernatural attacks against Pharaoh and Egypt. The tradition calls these the ten plagues. And we won't spend a lot of time talking about each one, but we're just going to list them in order so we get a feel for how wild this was. So in order, they were the, the river turning to blood. Next was frogs everywhere, which is basically just what it sounds like. <laughs> and in the story, everywhere actually means everywhere. Second were gnats everywhere. Kind of the same deal. It's like being in the North Woods in late June, but probably worse. Third, why it stop a good thing, I guess. Like there's flies everywhere. <laughs> if it ain't broken, don't fix it, right? Next, Egypt's livestock was killed. But the Israelites' animals were spared to make a point. Next, the people of Egypt were inflicted with what the story calls festering boils, which is insane. It sounds terrible. I've personally had some skin issues in the past. This sounds way worse. <laughs> Uh, it's never fun, but this sounds, this sounds awful. Um, and next, there was two attacks against Egypt's crops specifically. There was a massive hailstorm. We know a little bit about that in this part of the country. And secondly, there was a huge swarm of locusts. And after these two plagues, there was basically complete destruction of, of all of Egypt's food supply. And then there was this sort of magical darkness, the story says, for three days. In chapter 10, it says that Egypt will be covered with a darkness so thick you can feel it. This is wild stuff. Now, across all of these plagues, there's a pattern in the story. Uh, before almost every event, Pharaoh's warned. Then Pharaoh doesn't listen. Then God strikes Egypt with the plague. And then Pharaoh tries to negotiate. Like he's dealing with the peer rather than with the almighty God. He'll say things like, okay, okay, Moses, your people can go, but, but just, just your men. Or he says, okay, your people can go, but, but leave your animals here so you'll come back. When he negotiates, I think Pharaoh's clinging to the idea that he should be in control, even if the situation around him is showing that this is increasingly delusional. <clears throat> Have we ever tried to negotiate with God? Have you ever had a hard time giving control of your life to God? I definitely have on many occasions. It seems like every time I have a transition in my life, there's a new chance to say, am I going to trust? Am I going to trust this time? <laughs> I think sometimes we, we actually need to receive God's grace before we can trust that his plans are better than our own. Scripture tells us in the New Testament that God's kindness leads to our repentance. I think Moses needed to say yes to God's call before his in-between life started to make sense. Pharaoh needed to say yes to God's correction, but as the story says, he was closed off to receiving it. I pray right now, uh, God, would you give us grace to stay humble before you, to say yes to the ways you lead us, even now as we're together. Amen. Um, and there's, a, there's another theme that comes through the, this list of plagues in the story. And that's that the Egyptian people feel pretty differently than Pharaoh about what's going on. <laughs> By the time the third plague hits, the, the swarm of gnats, the court magicians can't match the magic anymore. And they come to Pharaoh and they say, this is the finger of God. And by the time the fifth plague comes, the big hailstorm, public opinion in Egypt has changed pretty dramatically. Some of Pharaoh's own officials actually listen to Moses' warning. And before the storm comes, they bring their animals and their, their, uh, their workers inside their homes to keep them safe. Other folks don't listen. But by the next, by after the, when the storm passes, the next plague comes. The Pharaoh's officials seem to be pretty, pretty unanimously convinced. After Moses warns Pharaoh about the locusts, the story says that all of Pharaoh's officials came and they told Pharaoh, don't you realize that Egypt lies in ruins? The Egyptian people recognizing what's happening, Pharaoh is still closed off. Does Pharaoh listen even to his own officials? 
No. Not even close. Even though Egypt is literally falling apart around him, Pharaoh's love of his own power has left him so blind, he can't even start to listen to Moses. He can't see that God is bringing an end to Pharaoh's reign of terror. Pharaoh can't see anything except a world of competition. Pharaoh thinks that any concession is automatically a loss. He can't imagine anything like a win-win situation. He can't even start to think that his own authority and his own legacy would actually increase if he governed justly with compassion. So the people have been convinced of God's power, but Pharaoh will not repent. He will not humble himself before God, and he will not let the Israelite people go. Isn't this how it, how it still goes often in our world? The pride of power, the powerful people hurts other folks, especially those who are most vulnerable. I'm thinking um, now as I was pre- preparing for this, this story right now uh, of Sudan and South Sudan. People are literally starving there without infrastructure because warlords are competing for power. In our own country, big retail corporations keep people at part-time hours so they don't have to pay health care. When the powerful prop themselves up, they do so at the expense of people without means. And this has happened through history, and God knows this. In the story of Exodus, we see God sees this. And God's response to injustice continues through the story of the Bible. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus begins his public ministry by declaring God's desire to bring justice in our world. And we can read along together to the words of Christ. Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Amen indeed. Just like Moses, Jesus survived when the local ruler in his day ordered the killing of baby boys. Just like Moses, Jesus passed through the place of death to lead God's people. Through God's power, Moses led God's people into freedom from oppression and slavery in Egypt. And through God's power, Jesus rose from the dead and leads away into freedom from the final oppressor, from death itself. From Moses, the Israelite people learned that Pharaoh did not have the final say over their lives and their identity as a people. When Jesus rose from the dead, his followers, the descendants of the ancient Israelites, learned that death itself does not have the last say. Political powers may still wield death as an instrument of control, as they do today. Greedy individuals like Pharaoh might think this is the only way to have power. The story of the Bible shows that death is not the end, and these powers are ultimately powerless. It's heavy, but they're grasping at straws. If you're paying close attention, you might have noticed I haven't yet mentioned plague number 10. And this is where things take a pretty dramatic turn in the story. Just like the first plague directly confronts Egypt's historic cruelty towards children, the last plague also asks if Pharaoh's power is worth more than children's lives. In chapter 11, Moses comes to Pharaoh and he warns him that all the firstborn sons will die in every family in Egypt. Again, this is heavy stuff. And with this explanation. Pharaoh is again given a choice. Will he sacrifice the lives of children in the name of his own power, just like the Pharaoh before him? Is his pride so strong that he would rather lead a torture state than humble himself and rule with justice? And this is wild to me because it's not that hard to imagine how different things could have been for both of these, both of these rulers, both of these pharaohs. For one thing, they could have just decided that killing children is, is not an option, right? It's not that. It's pretty obvious. 
how far down the path of your own self-importance do you have to be where you're making these kind of plans? But beyond that, both of these pharaohs could have actually cared for the Israelite people, and both nations could have been enriched, just like the pharaoh who ruled when Joseph came to Egypt with his family. The Israelites first came and both peoples flourished. But when he faces Moses, Pharaoh's too far down the path of self-importance. He can't, he can't repent. Instead of acknowledging his own sin and letting the Israelites free, Pharaoh chooses to gamble with the lives of Egypt's children. Pharaoh's desire for his own power has become so strong, he's willing to call a bluff against his own children. Also, he can keep thinking of himself as a god just like the Pharaoh before him. We won't go any farther in the story today. You'll hear what happens to Moses and the Israelites and to Pharaoh and the sons of Egypt next week. Hang in there. Come back in here. <laughs> Pastor Gay will walk us through the next part of the story. Uh, but n- right now, at this point, I'm struck by how Pharaoh's actions are a stark contrast to the kind of power that Jesus shows us. In the gospel stories from the Bible, Jesus' disciples, his own disciples, also think that powerful people don't need to respect and care for children. They tell parents to stop bothering Jesus with the things their kids need. And Jesus steps in and cuts that noise off. (laughs) He tells his disciples to let the children come to him. He then says that the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. And it's worth noting that the kingdom of heaven is bigger than all the land claimed by selfish leaders, bigger than Pharaoh's Egypt, bigger than our own country. And the story is told in three of the four gospel stories in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And all three of these gospel stories talk about Jesus welcoming children right before they tell the story of a rich man coming to Jesus. These stories are told together, I think, intentionally. I think it's a powerful comparison between those society considers powerful, like this rich man, and those we often overlook. The rich guy asks Jesus how he might find eternal life. And in no uncertain terms, Jesus tells him that he has to love the poor more than his own stuff. But just like Pharaoh, this man has come to believe that his own status and property are the ultimate goods in his life. And he walks away from Jesus. It's so sad. And this story ends with Jesus saying these words, and we can read together the words of Christ. I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property, along with persecution. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be least important then. And those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. If we read a little farther to the very end of the Bible, the book of Revelation tells us that the elders, those folks who are honored in the kingdom of God, lay down their crowns before the throne of God. Even though they're seated in places of honor, These folks know what's truly worthy of their love. It's not their own wealth. It's not their own accomplishments. What job you had, the stuff you have. It's not how much power they have to tell other people what to do. It's Jesus. The one who gives himself up in love to save God's people. In response to this love, these elders lay down their crowns all the honor that was given to them. And they give it back because God is better than everything else. And what a contrast to Pharaoh clinging on to his own importance. He seems so small next to that. Friends, I invite you, let's, let's not get, love our own power more than we love other people. Let's not give our love to those who cling to their own power Amen. Let's worship Jesus who lays down his life so we can live live freely and fully in God's kingdom. 
and we can continue doing that right now as we're together in worship. Uh, I invite the worship team back up to the stage at this point. I would also love to invite prayer ministers to come up on either side of the room. If you're a member of the prayer team here, we would love for you to come up and, and pray with folks at this point. Uh, the rest of us, I invite you to stand again. Uh, you're welcome to rise in spirit if that works better for you. And we have three tips we can, so we can, we can respond to the story today. Uh, number one, we got something to read. I invite you to read Mark chapter 10. We read little bits of it today. And you get bonus Jesus points if you read Exodus 7 through 10. There's a, many more details in the story than we talked about today, and it's, it's, a, it's a really impressive story. Second, there's something to pray. We can do that even now as we worship, but I invite you to take these questions into your week as well. First, ask God, how is God calling you to be a part of bringing freedom right now in your context? Secondly, and this is a dangerous question, so do with it what you will, ask God how you might need to be humble to follow God's lead. Lastly, we have something to do, and this is what we're actually gonna, we're gonna do it right now together. Um, and that is worship God. This is like when you had math homework and you got to finish it all before you went home. Well, um, when we worship, when we worship together, what we're doing in a big way, I think, is prioritizing. When we sing and pray and we receive communion together, we have the opportunity to say that God is more important than all the other things we have going on in our lives, all the other things we care about. When, 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 we, when we do this, we can receive God's grace to see ourselves as we really are, as loved by Christ. We can receive this love, and we can receive power from the Holy Spirit. And right now, we did something similar last week, but I invite you again, uh, just to open your hands in front of you, just like this, just a simple, a simple gesture. Um, this, is, this is a simple way, when we, when we do this, we're just saying to God that we want to trust God more than we want to cling to the things we care about. We're open, open before God's leading. We're also saying that we want to receive from God. Uh, the worship team's gonna lead us in song and communion and will dismiss us at the end of our service. Also, as we continue in worship, I invite you to come and receive prayer from any of these folks. They're good, safe, and kind people. They would love to pray God's blessing for you. Um, just a few, a few invitations would be, you know, if, 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 the Spirit's leading you right now, you have an inkling. There's this thing in my life I feel like is maybe I need, I need to not hold on to it so tightly. I need to be humble in this area. I would love to pray God's grace and blessing for that. Um, it was an invitation. Uh, if you, you feel a leading to, you want to you notice some folks that you maybe haven't noticed before. Uh, maybe even people in our, own, in our own church body. We would love to pray blessing for that, as well as anything else that you might to want to ask of God right now, we would love to join you in prayer, so please feel free. Let's worship, friends. So is there this, just this moment of quiet and peace? It's just our invitation to respond this morning and choose to say, God, what do you have for me in this, as John was talking about? We serve a Jesus who is so, so different than all these other leaders. And what is our response to him this morning? God, we are grateful for all that you do here, that you're doing in our lives. And we ask for the grace that you would just continue to, to work in us, to change us, to make us more like you, to recognize you, to see you at work, to help us to respond, even when it's hard. I would choose to worship you this morning, Jesus.
Jesus, I love you. With all my heart, all my mind, all of my soul, all my strength, Jesus, I. your feet, pouring it out for you, so that you are, all that you've done, I will worship you,
it's you this morning, in this time, in this place, in this moment, to just acknowledge you and to say thank you and to choose again today that we will follow you. And God, we acknowledge that that can be really hard. And so we ask for your grace as we choose you today. saints and angels bow before your throne all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing all the saints oh, all the saints and angels bow before your throne all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Sing worthy. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. All the saints, all the saints and angels, bow before your throne. All the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Sing worthy. You're worthy of it.
saints and angels bow before your throne lord we bow all the elders cast their crowns before the lamb of god and sing sing you're worthy of it all all our lives you're worthy of it all for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory every week we have the opportunity to receive communion together as a church family. There are two tables at the front of the room and one table in the back. The tables have unleavened bread and juice on them. These elements signify Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and gave thanks. He gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. You're welcome to the Lord's table anytime in the next song. tears from our faces dwell in the midst of us you can have your way you can have your way you can have
Tears from our faces. Dwell.